Tonight, the House passes NSA reform. But does it have any teeth? Plus, Edward Snowden's first U.S. TV interview. And Facebook wants to know more about you. Surprise! Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 93 for Thursday, May 22nd, 2014. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into the tech feed. After passing the Judiciary and Intelligence Committees earlier this month, the USA Freedom Act has passed the, U the House of Representatives, the U.S. House of Representatives, by a margin of 303 to 121. It's a bill meant to end NSA surveillance of phone records, it's now going to go to the Senate, but the Freedom Act will require the NSA to leave phone records in the hands of telephone companies for 18 months and make searches for specific terms only after getting court approval instead of bulk collection and storing. It also aims to limit how the agency collects online communications, makes it easier for companies to report the orders that they receive. However, before today's vote, the House of Rules Committee reported an amended version of the bill allowing the Director of National Intelligence to lead classification reviews rather than the Attorney General. Plus, companies can choose to reveal less about the orders that they've received than they could in previous versions. The NSA is also allowed to collect material about a target. Now, unsurprisingly, this isn't going over very well with some former Freedom Act advocates. The Reform Government Surveillance Coalition, whose members include Google and Facebook and Twitter and Dropbox and Yahoo, issued a statement yesterday announcing it was pulling its support of the bill because of this newly amended language that has, quote, moved in the wrong direction of true surveillance reforms, end quote. The latest draft opens up an unacceptable loophole that could enable the bulk collection of Internet users' data. While it makes important progress, we cannot support this bill as currently drafted and urge Congress to close this loophole to ensure meaningful reform. Story's not over yet. Edward Snowden is granting his first TV interview to Brian Williams of NBC in a one-on-one -on -one interview airing on May 28th at 10 p.m. Eastern. NBC is promising a revealing hour-long session that involves Snowden's media ally, Glenn Greenwald. And Gadget reports that Samsung is getting on the virtual reality bandwagon with a VR headset developed for mobile platforms and cite sources that say the product will be announced this year. Rumors have developers already working with a prototype. That one works with current Samsung products like the Galaxy Note 3, but the final product allegedly will need more powerful next-gen phones and tablets. The headset reportedly will have an OLED screen comparable to the Oculus Rift and a wired connection to the mobile device. Samsung reps have declined to comment. In other Samsung news, Samsung Music, also known as its Music Hub, will shut down on July 1st. An email sent out to Samsung Music users told them to, quote, take the time to download all purchased content and use any remaining vouchers for Samsung Music before July 1st, 2014. After that date, they will no longer be available. Music is a tough business these days. Google's latest update to its search ranking algorithm, known as Panda 4.0, has stripped out up to 80% of eBay's search results. This is according to Larry Kim, CEO of search marketing company Wordstream. Why? Well, it appears that eBay is being punished by Google as if it were a spam website, even though it's Google's single biggest PLA or product listing ads brand client. Previously, eBay had a very healthy organic search ranking. If you search for a product that could be bought or sold, an eBay page was usually found on the first page of results. That's very good. Kim says he made the calculation by searching for common terms used to produce search, good search results for eBay pages and that their failure to implement even the most basic of paid search best practices, like using negative keywords if you're not appearing in queries for vomit, that was what he used, made their research completely unreliable. Not sure exactly what eBay's response is yet. Google's released its latest version of Chrome, which includes an OK Google triggered voice searches that works automatically without requiring any clicks or other input from you. As a user, you'll need to enable it once and then provide Chrome permission to use the computer's mic if you haven't already. But then after that, you just open up a new tab, pull up Google.com, get Google's attention. OK, Google. And then you go about your search result. 
Starting this September, the California Department of Motor Vehicles will begin granting licenses to select driverless cars and the humans who drive with them. The licenses will cost $150 each. That covers 10 vehicles and up to 20 test drivers. However, this is only for designated employees of select autonomous vehicle manufacturers. Also, the car needs to be insured for at least $5 million against personal injury or death or property damage. The test driver has to be able to take immediate control of the car at all times, must have been a licensed driver for at least three years, have no more than one point on their license, and DUI histories need not apply. All that said, applications for the license open up in July. Hewlett Packard's second fiscal earnings quarters are in with mostly expected numbers from analysts, but bad news for employees. The company says it expects to lay off even more people. Now, job cuts were announced back in 2012, then set at about 34,000, but now will be increased by between 11,000 and 16,000 additional jobs. In a statement, CEO Meg Whitman said the turnaround effort she undertook when she stepped into the CEO role back in, CEO role back in 2011 remains on track. Coming up, the fastest robot with legs. He's really cute and you can see it in action for yourself. But first, I am joined by Roberto Baldwin, a reporter at The Next Web. Hey, Roberto. Hey, Sarah, how's it going? It's going very well. Uh, let's talk about Facebook. What do you think? Well, <laughs> Facebook's Facebook. And, you know, it's it's where my family and my friends from high school hang out. Exactly. So, it's, 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 it's hard. It's hard. You, 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 have to, you have to opt in. You have to be part of that community. And, you know, you, you, get, you know I've gotten a hold of a lot of old friends who, you know, I never would have gotten a hold of. There you go. Facebook. So there's there's that. There's well, like people. how about this article that you wrote uh, about quick coin that makes sharing Bitcoin as easy as sending a Facebook message? What's going on here? Well, you know, Bitcoin has been uh, it, it's in the shadows. I mean, the average person has no idea how Bitcoin works. And really, the average person doesn't understand how currency works in general, which is fine. You just have to be able to go to the store and buy, you know, a soda or a beer or whatever you want to purchase. Um, but Bitcoin, because it's been you know, relegated to this sort of hacker space, only hackers can use it, uh, it, it scared a lot of people off. And the average person has no idea how to get Bitcoin, how to send Bitcoin. So uh, QuickCoin has decided to make an app. It's actually a, it's a web-based app that allow you to send Bitcoin to your Facebook friends. It's actually pretty simple. You, if you have Bitcoin, you, you launch, you, uh, you launch the, the web-based app. You find one of your friends on Facebook and you send them, you know, X amount of Bitcoin, but they, they also have it in dollars. So, you know, you know, how many Satoshis or, or whatever equals, you know, $1, $4 or $5. It's, it's like Venmo, but for Bitcoin. Now, I mean, yeah, I'm a Venmo user. I think it works really well. Uh, QuickCoin is going to use your Facebook login. People are used to that with Facebook Connect. But, you know, you mentioned your high school friends and your family. How many people are going to take advantage of something that's associated with Bitcoin and scares a lot of people because, yeah, they think it's all about hacking. I think this is really, you know, Bitcoin's definitely in its infancy getting to the general public. If it does gain wide acceptance, it, there also has to be an ecosystem within, you know, the commerce area. Okay, what's the point of having currency if you can't buy anything? You know, there's a couple shops here in San Francisco that'll accept Bitcoin. But for the most part, I mean, I have a bunch of Bitcoin. Now what do I do? It's, it's, it's like having stock. You can't go to a store with a you know, stock certificate and buy something. So, you know, the, the, the whole, you know, it, it, like I said, it's still in its infancy. Once it gains more traction, um, you know, more and more people will use it. But this is a good first step. It's, and it's a good way to sort of take away some of the fear of Bitcoin where you can just really easily just share it with people. Another Facebook story uh, on your site, uh, Facebook stops irresponsibly defaulting privacy of new users post to public changes to friends. So as a new user up until now, if I, if I understand this correctly, anything you posted was set to public unless you changed it to friends, which people don't understand privacy settings. How did Facebook yeah. even get away with the, with the public default for so long? I think people just didn't realize it. I mean, you, you think, well, I'm only friends with these people on Facebook. So these are the only people who see, you know, my content when I post, you know, a story, when I post, you know, some rant, a rant, when I post a picture of my child. They don't think that, oh, anybody can go into Facebook, look up your name and see all your posts if it's set to public. So, it, you know, it, it was sort of this, you know, uh, 
everyone was sort of naive about what Facebook was allowing everyone to see. And so setting it to friends is actually, it's, it's a good step, but something that should have happened years ago. All right. Well, yeah, I mentioned earlier that uh, Chrome has the, the Google Now functionality. This is a little bit related on Facebook's side. A uh, story that came out yesterday that Facebook is going to add the, uh, the capacity to a, a Shazam-like product. So yeah. it'll use the microphone in your iOS or your Android app to be able to pull uh, music IDs or television show IDs from the audio around you. Mm -hmm. Should folks be worried about privacy in that sense? Because I guess you could think of it as Facebook is always listening to your life. It, if, if you're really concerned about privacy, you, should, you shouldn't let anything, you know, get to your microphone. For the most part, you know, you shouldn't be too concerned about, you know, Facebook's robots and servers telling everybody that you're listening to, you know, the latest song or the latest TV show or you're watching Game of Thrones. It's It's... But you know, it like, is opt like, in. Know, so yeah, it, it's opt in. Um, but if you're if you're truly concerned about privacy, my thing is you know don't allow anything to to access your microphone. Don't allow anything to access your 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 camera. Um, but but most people, I mean, I see a lot of indifference to a lot of the privacy things that are going on. They're like, well, I'm not doing anything wrong, so I shouldn't be concerned. Which is the wrong way to think about it. Um, you know, I, I doubt Facebook, you know, it's very, there's a very slim chance that Facebook is going to do anything malicious with this information, but you, you never know. And, you know, with NSA and hackers and whatnot, I mean, the last thing you want is hackers knowing that you're watching, uh, I don't know, two and a half men. I mean, you don't want anyone to know that, <laughs> right. especially hackers, Makes because they can dox target. you and that's a horrible, that's a horrible <laughs> thing to be sharing with the world that you, you love that horrid Charlie Sheen show. So uh, are you going to opt in or no? Uh, I don't really share like what I'm listening to or what I'm watching uh, via Facebook. I actually turn that option off when I'm using RDO just because I listen to I listen to, to, to a wide range of music. But for the most part, I feel like it just sort of creates a lot of noise in my feed. Well, thank you, Roberto Baldwin, reporter over at The Next Web, who also makes the wonderful Ginger cast that I watch every day. It's a six-second version of, well, sort of like this show. Uh, let folks know where they can read more of your work online. Uh, you can just go to thenextweb.com. Perfect. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, finally, got a little taste of that, you audio viewers. Who is the world's first fastest robot on legs? We have a winner, a current one anyway. It's OutRunner. This is a six-legged little machine built by Florida-based Robotics Unlimited that can reach speeds of 45 miles per hour. That's on a treadmill, but still 25 miles per hour in the great outdoors. Now, the previously fastest robot was built at Boston Dynamics, and that only got up to 16 miles per hour outdoors. 28.3 miles an hour on a treadmill. So we are making strides. Now, the team behind Robotics Unlimited is raising $150,000. It's a Kickstarter project in order to produce the OutRunner for actual sale. They say if they hit their goal, that they'll host a global robot race in which anyone can enter. The Robot Olympics people, they are not far off. I, for one, am excited. That's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. And I should do that, TN2. And write us at TN2 at twit.tv. Don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sarah Lane, and thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.